Welcome everybody back to the Hot and Cold podcast. I'm your host as always, David Miller, joined by my wonderful co-host, Andrew Watkins. And as you can see today, we have a very special guest, the man, the myth, the legend, the rat dog himself, Clint Ratkovich. Clint, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm great, David. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. I still can't believe you responded to my DM. I'm honestly still in shock. I'm a big fan of yours, and I didn't think in a million years we'd be able to get you on here. <laughs> no, yeah, like I said, man, thanks for having me. This is an honor. Yeah, of course. So we're going to sit down, talk to Clint today about uh, the NFL draft process, process, everything he's gone through, um, his time at Northern Illinois. If you don't know who he is, he's a fullback from Northern Illinois, as I said, um, currently on his way to getting his way into the NFL. So, um, Clint, first of all, I want to ask you, how does it feel to play fullback uh, in today's NFL, the way, or in today's football, the way it's kind of trending to where the position's kind of phasing out? Yeah. Uh, you know, I love it. It's kind of like you were saying, it's phasing out, but at the same time, the fullbacks, especially in the NFL, just are like evolving. You know, you can't just play that typical hand in the dirt fullback role. You got the guys like, uh, you know, Alec Ingold, Kyle Juszczyk, uh, CJ Ham on the Vikings to where they're asked to do a lot more than just block people now, you know. You got to be very versatile. You got to be able to catch the ball, run the ball, and, you know, block those big-time linebackers, big-time DN. So, you got to be very well-rounded, which, you know, it's it's tough, but, you know, I, I love it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, you mentioned a couple fullbacks that are currently big in the NFL. One of those fullbacks, obviously, is Kyle Juszczyk who myself and a lot of people have compared you to, how do those comparisons make you feel? Do you feel like that's a lot of uh, weight on your shoulders? Do you feel like it's a big comparison, or is it something that you're honored by and appreciate? Yeah, no, I definitely appreciate it. You know, Kyle Juszczyk, you can tell he's a very smart football player. He played at Harvard. He actually played tight end there, which kind of shows his versatility as well. But, uh, I mean, yeah, just to be in the same – you know, boat is him. People saying my skill set's very comparable to his is awesome. You know, he's a great football player. Yeah, absolutely. And um, again, you, you brought up your versatility. You're just bringing up all the points I want to touch on quickly here. Um, your versatility is fantastic. You played everywhere. They had you play in a position called the super back. Uh, you were a running back, fullback, tight end, slot receiver. I think you punted at least once. You're returning kicks. How do you think that versatility is going to help you when you get to the NFL level? Yeah, so, I mean, like it or not, the NFL, it's honestly a business. And, you know, one thing that versatility does for myself, uh, I feel like it gives me a really good chance to stick to an NFL roster. Because what it does is it'll save a roster spot. So instead of bringing on maybe an extra running back, you know, I can kind of fill up that backup running back role or, you know, backup, you know, receiver, tight end, whatever they need and kind of go after some other help on the team. You know, maybe they need help on defense or something and not have to, you know, fill up their roster spot. So just being so versatile kind of helps me try to get on the field. But it also, I feel like in the grand scheme of things, kind of, you know, helps out those NFL teams, like I said. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Andrew, is there anything you want to go with here? I'll hand it over to you for a minute. Um, moving more so into, like, the draft process, um, it's been said multiple times, but, like, the combine is so stressful for basically everybody that goes through it. What is it like to deal with that poking and prodding that happens during that time? Yeah, so I didn't actually go to the combine this year, but uh, East West was very similar. You know, you go to those interviews. Uh, basically, it's like fall camp again. You're up at six in the morning till ten o'clock at night. Uh, you'll do medicals. You'll talk to almost every NFL team, just doing thorough interviews, trying to get you get to know you as a person and as a football player. So you're just, you know, it definitely wears you down a little bit. You got to be mentally tough through it, but. Uh, you know, I love it because at the end of the day, you're talking football, and I, I just love football, so it's pretty easy once you get used to it. So, does the fact that you didn't get invited to the combine bother you? Is it something you expected, or is it just more motivation for you? Uh, it's motivation. You know, it was kind of fun watching those guys at the combine too, seeing the numbers they put up, and you know, I, I don't want to really say what I'm going to do in mine, but it's definitely going to surprise some people and. Uh, I think I'm going to outperform a lot of the guys that went. I'm, I'm excited to see that, honestly. You know, like I said, I'm real high on you. Had a lot of fun watching your tape in Northern Illinois, and uh, I'm really excited to see what you're capable of going forward. But going back to Northern Illinois, talking about kind of what you did in college, what was your favorite play 
throughout your college experience? Because I know you played a couple years. Ooh, uh, that's definitely a tough one. Uh, we had this play in is uh, kind of like this reverse trick play, you know, it, was, it, it made it look like counter and then I reversed mm -hmm. out of there and it more was a lead block for Trayvon Rudolph. And, you know, I think he sprung it for maybe two touchdowns this year, but just a little misdirection and able to go block and spring a touchdown for one of those guys was probably my favorite play this year. The fact that your favorite play from the past year was you not getting the ball in your hand, doing something for somebody else. <laughs> I love that. You're a team player. That's something that a lot of NFL teams obviously are looking for, especially at that type of position where you're not expected to be, you know, the number one guy in the offense or anything like that. Um, but speaking about kind of your mentality and the way you approach the game, I saw you say in an interview somewhere that you're a bit of a gym rat. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, I was kind of actually skinny growing up, you know, up until about sophomore year of high school is when I started to really get in the weight room and, you know, put on some weight. Uh, you know, I lift a lot with my brother. He's he's definitely more of a gym rat than I am. He played some college football up in Minnesota. But, uh, yeah, I was able to, you know, just work hard in there. I basically live in there with my strength coach, able to put up some really good numbers. I think, what was it, I benched this – past spring ball before the season it was right around 405 on bench and then I squatted over 600 so able to put up some solid numbers and you know it's just it's just hard work and also that's a testament to our strength program that we had at Northern you know the whole staff was awesome yeah I love that the fact that you're a hard-working team player that is such an invaluable like trait to have in a football player you know as a Bears fan somebody who or a team that's really looking for an identity and you know, a team that really is lacking that effort, a guy like you would be so great for the locker room. I'm going to bring up the fact that I want you to go to the Bears a couple times today. So just be ready for that. Um, <laughs> Andrew, you got anything else here? Um, trampolating off of being a gym rat, how do you stay motivated to make those improvements and to stay in the gym all that time? Yeah, you know, it, it's definitely tough, especially in season when you're banged up from the games, banged up from practice, you know, maybe your shoulders bothering you, your knees banged up, you know, took a helmet to it or something. It's hard to get under the barbell, but a uh, very important thing that I was taught was especially get the work done early. So, you know, like early on in the season is when you're going to, to start losing that strength because the season just wears you down. But uh, a big thing the weight room does is helps with injury prevention. And, you know, the strength program kind of talked about that. Our strength coach was huge on that, saying the stronger you are, the less likely you are to get injured. So, you know, I just took it very seriously and kind of always have that in the back of my mind, like putting the work in the weight room is going to help me on the field and to stay on the field. So, Going back to uh, Andrew talking about the draft earlier, how has the whole process been for you? Is I'm assuming it's got to be stressful, uh, you know, just thinking about the clock ticking slowly towards April, knowing when uh, the draft's coming up, maybe getting your name called, maybe not. I'm sure that's a fear that you've got to have currently, especially, you know, playing fullback and whatnot. Yeah, uh, it's just something to be ready for. You know, like you said, it's ticking, it's crazy. Uh, I've been training, I got out here in Pennsylvania, I believe it was January 3rd, and that felt like yesterday. You know, the draft's right around the corner, it feels like, and you know, it'd be awesome to get my name called, but at the end of the day, just being able to find a team and stick to it is what I really want to do. You know, it's been a dream of mine always to play at the highest level NFL football, and, you know, just to be able to be on a team and make a difference and, you know, fulfill my dreams. You know, if that's being drafted, not drafted, either way. As long as they give me a chance, I'm going to make the best of it, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I can't stress enough. I just love how you're approaching this. You know, all these guys <laughs> out there, you, you know they're going to be heartbroken when their name isn't called. But the fact that you realize that that isn't the end of it, you know, you see UDFAs go to the next level all the time and make such a big impact. And, you know, it's usually at the positions that aren't, you know, necessarily as sexy, like your quarterbacks, running backs, receivers, whatever. And – um the, f the fact that you realize that now is so huge for you because it's going to, you know, continue to motivate you, continue to push you and, and really help you with that next level. Andrew, you have anything here? Um, staying on the draft process, what is your least favorite part of being a prospect? I'd say just not knowing. Like, <laughs> I mean, you'll hear some stuff here and there, like some people, like some phone calls or texts. But honestly, you really don't know until draft day. You know, unless you're a solidified guy first 
first round, second round, maybe even third. But after that, I mean, four through seven or free agency is like a flip of a coin. You know, it changes so much and you don't know until draft day if, you know, you're a guy that everyone's looking at or a guy that nobody's looking at. And it's just kind of in the unknown. But, you know, like you said, you just got to put your head down and work and whatever happens, happens. So speaking of, you know, being a guy – you don't know if people are looking at you or not. Have you, I assume you've spoken to uh, NFL scouts, NFL GMs, whoever, what has been your takeaway from having that experience so far? Uh, it's tough. Just, it's awesome. man. it's just living through the experience, you know, putting all the hard work in from when you're a kid and, you know, finally paying off a little bit, even just be able to talk to some of these coaches in these positions is it's an honor. You know, they've, taking the time out of their day to, you know, some of them said they've watched my film, they've gone through it thoroughly, uh, talked football with me, and just even that aspect is, you know, awesome. You know, I've grown up my whole life to play at the highest level, and to be able to talk to these coaches and have a shot at it, it's just amazing. Now, when they're coming to you, are they asking you if you feel like you can play different positions with how versatile you are, or is it just, you know, they're expecting you to play out of the backfield at fullback? Yeah, I was actually talking to one the other day. I don't want to give out his yeah. name or anything, but uh, he, the way he said is, he's like, I don't see you as a true like halfback, true fullback. He said he just sees me as a football player that could make a difference on a team and help them win. So, uh, you know, that's kind of how I see myself. Coach wants me to play outside receiver, you know. <laughs> if if that's what he thinks is best for the team, I'll do it. You know, whatever it, whatever it takes to win. Yeah, and especially the way football is trending now, you know, you see guys like Isaiah Simmons and Micah Parsons who are playing three, four different positions on defense or on offense, a guy like Debo Samuel. There's no reason that more teams shouldn't be looking for guys like that. And you fit that perfectly. Uh, like you said, you know, you can do pretty much anything on offense. And, um, I, you know, special teams as well. I've seen you play on special teams. Do you enjoy that? Because I know a lot of people really think that's kind of like a underappreciated part of football, but I, I, I'd imagine it's fun. I love special teams. My favorite was kickoff, but they never let me run down there. <laughs> I was always telling Coach Hammock, let me just full sprint at someone and lay my head into him. But, you know, he was, uh, I had the chance to play kickoff return this year and then punt, which was awesome. So that's the good thing about punt. You're able to hit someone instead of them yeah. hitting you. So <laughs> get to play a little defense. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's got to be fun. You know, at the end of the day, I think the best part personally about playing football is hitting people. Like I get the, the appeal of, you know, scoring touchdowns and making the big flashy plays, but hitting somebody is just fun, you know, making contact with somebody. Um, Andrew, you have anything? Who was a player that you would compare yourself to out of anyone in the league? Uh, I mean, it's it's got to be use check. You know, like you guys said, a lot of people have been making the comparison, but just honestly, the way they use him in San Francisco is awesome. It, I mean, he's listed as a fullback, but he he rarely does what a fullback does. You know, he does everything and above. You know, he's got his hand in the dirt some plays, but then other plays he's lined out as a receiver. They're throwing him seam balls up the middle, and he's throwing safeties around. Like, just how versatile he is and what he can do on the football field makes it hard for a defense to game plan against. And, you know, I, I feel like my game's very similar to his. Now, are there any players that – don't play the same position as you, that you've taken anything out of your game. I've seen you in interviews talking about Julian Edelman being an inspiration for you kind of as a receiver. So is there anyone else like that? Uh, yeah, Edelman for sure. And then uh, I was watching some route cutups on uh, Cooper Cup this year. Because it's interesting, he's not really the fastest receiver out there. I believe he ran like a 4.61 or 4.62 at the Combine. Uh, but like on the field, you couldn't tell. If you didn't know that time behind him, you'd think he's a – four three guy just like all the rest of them uh just how smart he is you know there was one play he was talking about a blitz it was a fire zone blitz and just about how they're going to replace it with the safeties and how he's attacking the defense just because of that uh you know i definitely what that's what makes a good football player is being smart you know once you get to the nfl level everyone's talented everyone's athletic but you just got to be smart yeah absolutely andrew um, do you have a player that inspired you when you were younger to get into football and to pursue it at this level? Uh, my cousin, Andrew, actually. He's an older cousin, about 10 years older than me. 
and my my brother is 14 months older than me and we were kind of growing up together and he started playing football my cousin and you know we went to a few of his games like this is awesome i gotta i gotta go hit somebody uh so i think i started in third grade or maybe second grade my brother started in fourth grade but uh yeah he played linebacker at a d2 school up in minnesota and he was just a beast you know it was awesome watching him play and he definitely inspired me so what positions did you play growing up and when did you eventually get into playing fullback uh growing up it was quarterback i'll list all of them quarterback running back slot receiver the number one receiver outside as well uh tight end and then on defense, I played some Mike linebacker, kind of like a st- stand-up edge rusher. Um, my freshman year in college, actually, at Western, I was a safety. And then uh, basically all special teams. I was, I was the punter in high school. And then it was uh, second year at Western Illinois was when I made the transition to fullback or kind of that H-back spot. You know, I was kind of a bigger running back. And we had some good running backs at the time, so they were trying to find a way to get me on the field. And I was able to block really well for them. So they're like, yeah, throw you out there and go hit somebody. So you've really played everywhere. You, you've really done it all. You are the true super back. Um, when, <laughs> I guess you can say that, yeah, yeah. Yeah. When did that start? When did the whole super back thing start? That was at Western Illinois, our position coach. It was, they were all talking about it. They are like, yeah, we don't even really know what you play. And then uh, – Position coach JP Boudreau came up with these like, nah, we'll just start calling you super back. It sounds good. It'll it'll sell tickets. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love that. Andrew? Yeah. Um, do you have any like highlights that you remember from when you were younger? Oh uh, there was uh are you saying specific highlights or just in general for football? Well, Basically, either one. Any sort of memory that you have from growing up playing football? Yeah, so I actually played for a private, like, Catholic school league, and we were actually really good. Sixth, seventh, eighth grade year, we went undefeated and won the championship against the same team every single year. (laughs) So we met the same poor same team every year, all three years in the uh, championship game. And, you know, they're all three battles, and we're definitely the best two teams in the conference, but... Uh, I think it was eighth grade year. I sealed it up with a pick six when the last like minute of the game to to close it off. So that was that was a great one growing up. So, you know, going back to when you were in college, um, playing at Northern Illinois. Obviously, it's not one of those big flashy schools like Alabama or Clemson, whatever. But you did have an opportunity to play against some of those guys. Um, again, I saw an interview where you talk, were talking about playing up against Aiden Hutchinson specifically, having to chip him and whatnot. Do you think that has really helped, you know, getting to play against those big schools? Do you think that's really helped you kind of prepare mentally and physically potentially for what you're going to have to deal with in the NFL? Yeah. Uh, The biggest difference I'd say is, especially with that, like we played Michigan. Uh, They were a solid defense, really good players all around. But I feel like the biggest thing that separates a team like that compared to, you know, some of these smaller schools like a Mac. It's just those freaks like Aiden Hutchinson. You know, they got like one or two of those guys that are just insane athletes. And especially him, he's a very smart football player as well. And uh, other than that, though, you know, it's it's very similar football. You know, the Mac is, I feel like, really good football. You know, there's doesn't seem like there's too much defense some games, but I just feel like it's better offense. You know, there's very good teams in the Mac, and, you know, there's very good players, so... Uh, you get a little bit of glimpse of that everywhere you go, and th- that's the biggest difference, I'd say, is just those schools have those few players who are just, you can tell, NFL level. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I wasn't trying to say anything negative about Northern Illinois, obviously. I know the no, Mac no, is super I, competitive. I, I watched so much of your game this year. I mean, literally, I'm not a big college football fan, and I was tuning into Northern Illinois games just to watch you play football. You're just such an exciting football player to watch. Um, there was one play specifically, I can't remember who it was against, but you broke off for like a 90-yard touchdown. And just seeing uh, yeah, just seeing a guy playing fullback doing that, it, it's just it's just fun because it's old school football. It's it's very reminiscent of, you know, back in like the 80s and 90s when the position was at its peak. Um, but, you know, kind of 
transitioning more to the NFL. Obviously, I know you're going to be happy with any team giving you an opportunity, but growing up, was there a team you cheered for? Would there be one team that if they gave you an opportunity, it would just mean a little bit extra? Uh, the big thing is I don't really have a team. You know, I, I did like the Bears growing up. I was a fan of them. I uh, got to throw them out there. Definitely the uh, hometown team. But uh, my grandma was always a big Cowboys fan. And, uh, I mean, I, I did watch them a little bit. But at the same time, like I was saying, I didn't really have a team. I just kind of followed some players around. And, you know, and nowadays NFL, it seems like people are getting traded, traded every other week. So it's hard to hard to like a team. And then the next day it seems completely different because, you know, players come and go. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, Andrew, is there anything here you want to add? I'm trying to think of how to word this. Um, what is, what do you anticipate will be the biggest difference between the NFL and college in terms of like speed of the game or this talent in general or just like how complicated things will get in like a playbook or something like that? Yeah, uh, speed of the game is definitely a big one. Uh, you know, like I said, everyone's going to be fast and athletic in the NFL. You got those DNs running four threes, which is insane uh but at the same time as good as the defense gets the offense is just as good so i feel like the speed of the game is going to be well matched and kind of easy to pick up in that end and playbook wise i've always been kind of good at you know learning playbooks uh being a quarterback previously i kind of learned like whole plays instead of just what i'm doing in a play kind of understand the concept which helps me out a lot because when you understand what everyone around you is doing, it kind of helps you understand what you have to do. And, you know, if someone messes something up or if you mess something up, you know, your health's at or, you know, just understanding whole schemes is definitely going to help me out in the future. Was there anything that a coach told you, whether it was high school, college, even younger, that has really stuck with you and kind of helps you become the player you are currently? Uh, don't make the same mistake twice. Uh it's a big one because, you know, it's it's all about being coachable. Because if a coach is telling you one thing, and, you know, everyone makes mistakes in football, but it's the little things that, you know, if you run the wrong route on this play or, you know, do something that is avoidable and you do it same or you make the same mistake twice, it's just showing, A, that you're not coachable, and B, that you're not listening. So, you know, that's, that's the biggest thing that I've took. It was from one of my Western Illinois coaches, and, to try to hold hold true to it still, you know, it's it's one thing and it shows that you really care. Uh, Andrew? I had something, but I forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, shoot. I have one, too, and I forgot it. <laughs> That's great timing. That's great timing. Um, I don't know. Is there any advice you'd give an aspiring athlete, someone trying to, you know, get to the college level and then eventually the pro level? Uh, just don't overlook everything. You know, nowadays everyone sees a star next to their name or something or, you know, a rating next to them. And, uh, especially even kids who, you know, I played at a lower level, Division One FCS, uh, Little Western Illinois. And, you know, people count out, I guess you can say lower level football, like Division One FCS or D2, D3, whatever it is. But football's football. And you see guys every year getting picked up from D3 schools, D2 schools, even getting drafted. And, I mean, as long as you, you know, play like play like a champ, play the NFL talent, you can make it from anywhere. So don't, don't get down on what other people are saying about you, you know, what stars they're giving you or where you're playing. You know, just make the best of it and – just do all that you can do. So do you think playing at the FCS level and then moving up into the MAC gave you a different perspective and a different appreciation for football? Uh, I do, yeah. I'd say the football was very similar. You know, very uh, – Missouri Valley was definitely physical. You know, we played teams, NDSU, Northern Iowa, so, you know, some big schools where, you know, they got those guys. What was it Trevor Penning, some of those big-time old linemen uh, – uh, northern iowa that are getting projected to get drafted second third round so you know like i said uh there's talent everywhere you know i feel like there's no real such thing as you know you can't make it if you're at a smaller school you know you can make it from anywhere yeah i gotta assume you know seeing guys especially from ndsu like uh 
you know, Trey Lance going in the first round or not. Trey, yeah. Um, and uh, now Christian Watson, you know, he's shooting up draft boards. I assume that's got to feel good, you know, to see guys at that level, to know you are kind of in that same vein, to see that they're finally getting the recognition they deserve, especially at a time where you're about to enter the league. Um, yeah. I mean, it's crazy too. It's like every year, uh, I believe it was my first year at Western, like six or seven guys got drafted at NDSU. And um, it's just every year you'll see it out of the FCS level, D2 level. They're just, they keep taking guys and, you know, you, you sometimes ask yourself like why don't they do it more you know some of these guys are balling out at you know some small school putting up 1500 yards receiving 15 touchdowns or something they're like oh well it's just the talent he played against well i mean it then they'll go to their pro day or whatever they'll run like a four three forty or something and the guy's faster than all these guys from the bigger schools stronger than all of them it's like well not much you can say now so yeah, it's awesome to see that some of those guys are getting the recognition they deserve. Yeah, I was going to ask you, too. Uh, you hit the nail on the head talking about the, the the concern with the talent they're playing against, and then you go to these pro days, and these guys are absolutely balling out. Andrew, did you remember your question? Yes. What do you think is the most important trait in a in a prospect and somebody that's going into the NFL as an NFL hopeful? Oh. Uh... I mean, definitely the most important is you got to be a baller. I mean, if you're if you're not going to be able to play against those NFL talent guys, NFL caliber guys, they're just not going to keep you around. I mean, you can be the nicest guy you want. You can be a great locker room guy. You can be, you know, perfect on and off the field. But if you can't perform on the field, it's, it's not really going to matter in the end. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with, like, the white guy stereotype for running backs. He's gritty. He's got a high motor. <laughs> Uh, you know, great locker room guy, all that. Do you feel like that applies to you? Yeah, you know, I, I definitely take everything seriously. I definitely uh, have heard the comparison before, you know, but uh, but uh, it is what it is. And you just, like, like I said, I just go to practice every day uh, on and off the field. I'm working as hard as I can, you know, to try to improve my game and just be the best that I can be. All right, Andrew, do you have anything else? I've I've been making them up as I go, and I, <laughs> all right. I think I'm done. <laughs> all right, I got all right. So with that, we have one final question for you. You know, an NFL GM happens to come across this. An NFL scout happens to come across this. Why should they take a chance on Clint Rakovich? Uh, like I said, you know, versatility is awesome. It's gonna help. It's going to help the team uh, for who I am as a person. You know, I'm going to be that great locker room guy. I'm going to be, you know, uh, I'm going to have a championship mindset. And on the field, I'm going to help a team win. You know, I'm going to be a great special teams guy. Uh, throw me in there on offense wherever you need me, and I'm definitely going to make a difference and help you guys win. I love that. That's perfect. Well, Clint, it was great having you on here. Again, can't thank you enough for coming on. Um, hopefully I get to see you in one of these next year. But with that being said, you know, that that was wonderful. All right. I hope you all enjoyed that interview with uh, Clint Rakovich. Wonderful guy. Absolutely wonderful guy to sit down and talk to. We had a blast. Um, I learned a lot, you know, extremely intelligent football mind. And, and I mean it when I say I hope he's wearing this next year. Um, I probably gushed a little bit more than I should have, but, um, <laughs> you know, it, it is what it is. That, that was the first time we've had somebody on the show. We still can't believe we got him on. But, uh, Andrew, do you have anything you want to add to that before we move I'm, on and start talking I'm about football? Flabbergasted. flabbergasted. I'm flabbergasted. That's a big no, word for you. That He's such a cool guy. That's he like was. the coolest guy I've ever talked to legitimately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I hope the best for him. I can genuinely see him getting drafted. You know, I do too. like, like as a fullback, that's a huge deal. You know, like there's people talking this year. There's this punter, uh, Matt Ariza, I think is how you say his name. People are looking at him as like a third round talent. You know, this could be a weird year for weird positions getting drafted. And, uh, you know, genuinely sitting and watching Clint's tape, he really could uh, get himself drafted. Maybe even not to play running back or play fullback. You know, that guy, or, uh, he was talking about that scout or GM or whoever it was he talked to that said they'd want him as an offensive weapon. That, very fitting. And I just want to put it out there. The Chicago Bears are switching to a Shanahan-style offense. And the Shanahan-style offense is known for using a fullback, namely yep. Kyle Juszczyk, 
who Clint Radkovich is like the baby version of. Just saying, I could be wearing uh, – it, it, he wears number 25, so I could be wearing a white 25 jersey during one of these podcasts with the name Ratkovich on the back. Um, <laughs> but speaking of football, uh, Andrew and I are going to sit here. We're going to talk about the um, the trades that have gone down because the NFL is going wild right now. And I guess we kind of have to start with the the one that pertains to my team, being Khalil Mack getting traded to the, uh, the L.A. Chargers. Andrew, why don't you go ahead and talk for a moment? I'll be right back. Oh, God. Um, I think that this is a, it's like a, it's a good move for both teams. I think that there is an issue with Max staying healthy, but I still think that he's an elite level talent. And I think that he's going to add a lot to that Chargers defense. And then the fact, I don't even, what did they give up for him? What did they give in return for Mac? Uh, a second round pick this year and a sixth round pick next year. Yeah, that second's going to be very valuable, especially in this draft. Mm-hmm. So I, th- I think it's a win-win for both teams. Yeah. Now, see, I, I have conflicting opinions on this because on one hand, you know, the Bears fan in me that owns this, and if you look back there on that shelf, wherever it's at, there's a pop figure in this guy. It hurts. It hurts my heart because now he's not on the team anymore. I don't get to watch Khalil Mack play football. But then, like, the analytical smart fan is like, well, this trade makes sense, you know. Cleo Max, 31. He's not getting any younger. He's dealt with injuries throughout his entire tenure in Chicago. Outside of 2018, where he was the best player on the football field every time we played football, he hasn't been himself. He's, excuse me, he's been dealing with foot injuries. He's been dealing with leg injuries. It's been everything. All the lower half of his body has been beat up. And you look at a guy like that, again, 31, playing a very physical position on a massive contract. And this team wants to start fresh. This is a team, new GM, new coach, young quarterback you want to build around. You need to get rid of them. And it sucks. It really does. Genuinely, my heart hurts thinking about Khalil Mack not being on the Bears next year. But you get t- over $20 million in cap room next year. Uh, in 2023, the Bears have $146 million in cap or something like that. And then you don't have to worry about them the year after that. You save $6 million this year. Sure, you're eating twenty four in penalty, but, you know, that's twenty or that's six million that you don't have to pay Khalil Mack, and you get the team younger. You get that second round pick, but that now gives you the opportunity to trade back and get more picks, get more assets for the draft. It sucks. The Bears' defense is going to be worse without him, but it had to be done because if Mack gets hurt this year, like he did last year, his value drops even more. His value yeah. drops even more. The Bears should have traded him last season, in my opinion. If I'm being hundred percent honest, but Ryan Pace doesn't know how to admit when he's wrong, doesn't know how to admit defeat. So he would just continuously kick the can down the road until it eventually caught up with him. So this is just Ryan Poles, his first move, you know, cutting out a big contract, making the big, bold move that he needed to make to help this team in the long run. And he's continuously doing that. He cut Tariq Cohen. He cut Eddie Goldman, two fan favorite players. I never liked Tariq Cohen. I hate that little bastard so much. He's not a good football player. Uh, Eddie Goldman, another guy that I loved. You know, again, he's aging. He hasn't been himself. He sat out the COVID year, and then after the COVID year, he was coming back and, like, might play, might not in in some weird debacle. And uh, Danny Trevathan, who, again, is in his 30s, get rid of him. He's just making moves for the future. And like I said, the Bears have draft capital now. We don't have a first-round pick this year still, which sucks, but two seconds is good enough. And obviously for the Chargers, I mean, you've got Khalil Mack now opposite of Joey Bosa, which is terrifying, and especially in a division now, which we'll get to in a minute, that has probably the best quarterback division ever. That's so important. And an underrated asset of Khalil Mack's uh, game and whatnot is his ability against the run. He's one of the best edge rushers in football against the run. And the Chargers' number one weakness last year was the run game. So if you go out there, you get Khalil Mack off one edge, you have Joey Bosa off the other, and you go into the draft and draft the Hulk himself, Jordan Davis, who is a phenomenal run defender and absolutely could be sitting at 17. All of a sudden, this weakness that you know pretty much single-handedly ruined your team last year was a big reason why your team didn't go anywhere, now becomes a strength you now become one of the better run defense teams on paper. So it's a great trade for both sides, like you said. But it it does hurt my heart and soul. To to my very core, I am in pain. But it needed to happen. Um, 
And the way that this could go is like if he, like it could go either way. Like the Bears could be seen as like an amazing, like such a smart move for the Bears if he remains injured. But if he comes back and he's not injured and he's how he he's just as good as he was in 2018 or before he got all these injuries, then it'll seem like the Bears are idiots. Mm-hmm. But in, in the end, for the Bears, it doesn't really matter because yeah. you do have that large contract that you have to get rid of. It is very smart to hit the reset button and just build around all these young guys that you have. I, I, it's it's very complicated to see for now but it could be like the best move of the of the offseason if mac doesn't pan out in, for the chargers yeah i mean i'm gonna tell you right now in my opinion i think he's gonna be fine because a big reason why mac got hurt so much is because when he was in chicago he was always on the field the bears defense never got a break and you know that's just because of piss poor offensive play where with the chargers you have justin herbert and you had one of the best pass offenses in football last year and you have a great run game with Austin Eckler, they're not going to be on the field near as much, and Mac's not going to be that number one guy. Joey Bosa is probably going to be that number one guy, and even if Mac is that number one guy, he's still not going to be on the field as much. So his production is going to go up. You know, he had six sacks in seven games this past year. He'll probably hit double-digit sacks again, and then in the offseason, Bears fans are going to have to hear, you traded away one of the best pass rushers in football, blah, blah, blah. Well, he'll be 32 by then. And we're going to have a 23, 24-year-old quarterback. I can't remember how old Fields is off the top of my head. And a young football team. And that's what the entire point of this is. The entire direction of the Chicago Bears right now is building this team around Justin Fields, his strengths, making him the best he can possibly be, and also setting it up for the future to fit with his timeline. Khalil Mack, even if he doesn't get traded, and even if he is not hurt, He's not going to be here in four or five years, and Justin Fields still will be. And then four or five years down the line, when he's potentially a superstar, you have a gaping hole at edge rusher you need to fill. So you're better off just to fill it now, worry about it now, and then you know not have to worry about it later on. Because that's that was the Ryan Pace method. You, you get temporary fixes, and then you push it off till when it's probably not going to be your problem because you're probably going to be fired. Ryan Poles realizes he needs to build this team now. I think what's going to end up happening is you build the offense this offseason, sign free agents, draft people, whatever. And then next offseason, when you have all this money, that's when you spend on defense. That's when you set up Matt Eberflus. Because Matt Eberflus in Indianapolis was known for making a lot work with not a lot. You know, he would get production out of role player type guys that aren't superstars, aren't great. And I think Chicago is going to do that. You get a couple veteran guys, maybe draft a couple guys in the late rounds, develop the guys you have now. Chicago is not going to be good next year. It's a development year. But 2023, 24, 24, 2025, if Fields becomes what Fields is, then this team's going to be scary. But there is a team who got a quarterback that's going to help them now, and that's the Denver Broncos, who traded two first-round picks, including the ninth overall pick, two second-round picks, including a top pick in the or top second-round pick in this year's draft, Shelby Harris, Noah Fant, and Drew Locke, for Russell Wilson. This trade obviously makes the AFC West the best quarterback division probably ever. Like Derek Carr is easily the best worst quarterback in a division ever. And he might not even be there. There's rumors he's going to get traded. But you have Patrick Mahomes, Justin Herbert, and Russell Wilson. Three top 10 quarterbacks all in the same division. And that's just insane. That, that, that's insanity. AFC West football is going to be must watch football. The only concern here is I don't know if this makes the Broncos contenders just because of what they're dealing with in their division. This is a team that was a quarterback away, but now they have to deal with Mahomes twice a year. They have to deal with Justin Herbert twice a year. They have to deal with the Raiders twice a year. If they keep Derek Carr, they might be a sneaky playoff team. Only three teams from that division can make the playoffs. If that, if that. And and that's that's just a hard sell for me. What do you think, Andrew? I think out... Even though they are, they were a quarterback away. Now you are facing probably two of the best teams in the league, at least because you have the Chargers with Mac, and you have the the Chiefs just being the Chiefs with so Herbert. Like even... Oh, never mind, never mind. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. I'm stupid. I, I thought you meant Mac Jones. That'd be the most random mix-up. Yeah, the most random well, mix-up. no, they're, they're they're both white boys that wear number ten. You know, 
I don't know why my brain assumed that you mixed that up. That, that I am sorry. I think I just called you an idiot on accident. <laughs> but, but continue. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, like, even though you are this great team now with Russell Wilson, you have to go up against two other great teams. And if the Chiefs remain as good as they have been, they're going to be a step above basically any other team in the league other than the teams that are in their own division. It's just so competitive in that division that it's hard to say who will make it out. Yeah. And with the Broncos too, you know, you're mortgaging your future with this trade. Two first round picks, two second round picks. That's nothing to sneeze at. And obviously I guess that won't affect you other than this year and next year. But this year sitting at the ninth pick, you could have gotten yourself a potential superstar. You know, a guy like Sauce Gardner, Kayvon Thibodeau, there are genuine potential Hall of Fame guys at the top of this draft class. And you're, you're saying, basically, we believe in our roster now. We get this quarterback, and that doesn't matter. And they might be right. They might not. We'll see. Oh, excuse me. But, yeah, like you said, having to deal with Mac twice a year, having to deal with Mahomes twice a year. Um, and then the other guys on that Chargers defense, too, you know, Derwin James, Joey Bosa, that defense is stacked now. And the Chiefs, you know, they might actually be in a weird spot next year where they have Mahomes, they have Hill, they have Kelsey, but they're losing Tyron Matthew on defense. Their defense already was kind of up and down. Uh, Depending on what kind of talent they add back there, maybe they're the team to take a step back. Maybe it is the Broncos and the Chargers to really step up. That division could go any which way. And I I just feel bad for the Raiders. Like I said, the Raiders could be a sneaky playoff team, but – that would require one of those other teams to really be bad. They, they would really have to not meet expectations. I genuinely think the Raiders would be smart to trade Derek Carr right now. Get as much value out of him as you possibly can. Trade away everything else, have a fire sale, and just build for the future. Because Russ is already 32, I think. He's not going to be there forever. The Chiefs are paying Patrick Mahomes $500 million. They're eventually not going to be able to keep up the roster around him. Eventually that's going to start to fall apart. So you'll be able to put yourself in a position to succeed in the future, a couple years down the line. And I know I kind of preach that teams need to worry about winning now over in the future. Cause like the future is great, but winning now is what matters when you're in this type of situation. There is no now th- th- there, there straight up is no now it is the future or bust. So if they send Derek Carr somewhere, that's going to give them a good bit of draft picks. Cause they will Derek Carr's a good quarterback and quarterbacks are going to be in high demand now. You know, you sit and wait, see where Deshaun Watson's going to go. And then it's Derek Carr and Kirk Cousins are the top two quarterbacks available. And say what you want about Kirk Cousins, Derek Carr blows him out of the water. And a team like Indianapolis or uh, I was going to say Washington, I guess not. I forgot they traded for Carson Wentz. Um, A team like Indianapolis or Cleveland or Pittsburgh would easily give you a boatload of draft capital and potentially young pieces for a guy like Derek Carr because that puts them over the hump and puts them in a position to win. And, um, yeah, it, it, it's just a rough time to be an AFC West fan, specifically if you're a Raiders fan, because all you see all these other teams getting so much better. You see them adding all these big-name players, and you're sitting there like, well, you know, we, we might draft somebody in the 20s. We might draft somebody in the 20s. You know, that, that's just it, – it's just not good, especially after going to the, the divisional round. Right? No, they got beat in the wild card round. They played the Bengals first round. I got the Bengals or the yeah. Raiders and Titans confused there for a second. That's um, that's rough for them. I feel bad for them, truly. Yeah. And to add it on to the trade, just in general, it's a very confusing trade for them because they traded away Von Miller, who would have been somebody for the win now moment, mm-hmm. but instead now they're trading for a win now after trading away somebody that was old and would have helped them win. Well, the good thing about Von Miller is he's about to hit free agency. He he only, I did. I have seen that that he might resign with them. There's probably a pretty good chance he resigns with them, which would push them over the hump even more. I honestly didn't even think about Von. That's a good point. Adding him, you know, again, I feel bad for Derek Carr if he stays there because you're going (laughs) against Bosa and Mac two weeks. You're going against Von Miller and Bradley Chubb for two weeks. And then you play the Chiefs, but in that game, you have to keep up with Patrick Mahomes. 
So Der- if I'm Derek Carr, I'm asking to get out. Yeah, poor I, Derek. Man. Like I, I respect loyalty. You know, it's kind of like the the whole Damian Lillard thing where you stay there forever. You don't win anything, but the loyalties, whatever. I respect it. But you yeah. need to get out of there. You need to go. Because <laughs> imagine you get traded to Cleveland. You know, instead of playing Mahomes and uh, Wilson and Herbert, you're playing Lamar, who is still really good, Joe Burrow, who is still really good, and then you get that two-week break where you're playing like Mason Rudolph or Marcus Mariota or uh, Dwayne Haskins, whoever the hell Pittsburgh's starting, because it's not going to be somebody good. Um, or, you know, go even further, get traded to the Colts, go up against Davis Mills twice a year and uh, uh, Brian Tannehill twice a year, whatever. I, I do feel bad for Derek Carr. Um, but, you know, speaking of the AFC South, Deshaun Watson something we've got to talk about too. Um, I- I'm curious to hear what you think about this the whole situation. A whole situation. It's just, just you know, you know the new ruling, right? That he was found yeah. not guilty on all criminal charges and all that. I I've seen stuff on like TikTok. I don't like the jokes about it. Mm-hmm. Cause like he he's ruled not guilty or whatever, but like it still happened. It's still a black mark, and that could be seen either way. Like it could be seen as like he was he fought back against it it was not true they just came out of nowhere and he fought back against it or it could be that he just had good lawyers and a lot of money and silenced them and whatever and i don't like that people on twitter are also saying that like oh now that the charges are dropped he is going to his his trade value is going way up like it's just like uh it's like a matter of like football over humanity like a humanitarian look at it mm-hmm. But it also it could be that it's not true. It could be true. It's still a lot of unknown. Yeah. I mean, again, when it, especially cases like this, when we're talking about sexual assault, sexual harassment, it's so hard to find evidence. You know, you have to almost have an eyewitness or you need to have a DNA sample. And, you know, I, I would assume they don't have a DNA sample because these were events that occurred a while ago. Um, that that would have that would be kind of suspicious if they would have a DNA sample. I think, but like not having an eyewitness, you know, the the one case that I always point or that you know that's always like brought up, it was him one on one with some woman, and there's no evidence. I can't imagine they have cameras in a massage parlor or whatever. So it's hard to have evidence. It's hard to really prove it. So a lot of these cases do end up being that the 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 criminal charges get dropped, but there's still the civil charges, the civil case, and they end up getting paid off. And it's unfortunate. It really is. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there's a way to fix it. I'm not a legal expert, obviously. I'm a sports guy. I don't know jack shit about the American legal system. So I don't know if there's a way to get around that. I don't know if there's a way to fix that potentially. But um, it, it's just unfortunate that that's what happened. And then, you know, as soon as it comes out, the the – criminal charges are dropped. He's innocent. He didn't do it. Everyone that was making fun of him, you're a fraud, you know, whatever the people going all in defending this man with their life. Again, we don't know if he's innocent. And I genuinely find it hard to believe that over 20 women accused him and all of them lied. If even one of them is telling the truth, just one, the one out of 20, that's all it takes for him to be a not good person. And, you know, we've talked on here before about the the kind of culture that breeds these type of individuals where they're handed everything. And then when someone finally tells them, no, they snap. And I, I just I just hate that that's how everything works. And it really sucks because it's so prevalent in the NFL. And the NFL is something that I love so much and I've loved for so long. And I want to continue to support and engage with for the rest of my life. But it's so hard to ignore these little black marks. You know, because they keep adding up and adding up and adding up. And, you know, Watson's not going to get in any trouble. You know, he, he's going to have to pay these women off, but he's not going to get in any trouble. And you brought up his trade value. The unfortunate truth is it is about to skyrocket. You know, we're already hearing rumors that the Carolina Panthers are closing in on a deal or the Seattle Seahawks are closing in on a deal and new teams are being added in. New teams are dropping up because at the end of the day, he's a 25 year old quarterback and he's good. He's really good at the game of football. And. If there's no legal charges or, or no uh, criminal charges, then there's nothing to worry about. You know, there, there, there's really nothing to worry about. And it's unfortunate. You know, I don't know whether Watson's innocent, truly innocent or not. We'll never know. We, we will genuinely never know. But 
it, it's just disgusting to think that he could potentially have done all of these heinous things and, and just got away with it and continue to play a sport for hundreds of millions of dollars for fame, for whatever. And then people will continue to hold him on a pedestal and eventually it'll just kind of fade out. No one will think about it. No one will remember it. Look at Ben Roethlisberger. You know, he had what, I think three cases against him, something like that, two or three people forgot about it. People were celebrating him when he retired and he got to continue to play in the NFL for like an extra decade. And he's going to be a hall of famer. And what are the best quarterbacks to ever live? Again, I don't know if Ben really did it, but in these situations, I tend to believe women because that is something that is so hard to lie about something that is, so hard to come forward about, you know, we saw the Bill Cosby situation and the whole me too movement. Those were such like monumental things for women everywhere because it's, it's just so hard to live with that guilt. And obviously I don't know firsthand. I I've been lucky enough to never have to deal with anything like that in my personal life. Um, I do have friends that have dealt with it and I've spoken to them about it obviously and seen how it's affect that affected them. And I know everybody's different, but having to carry that with you and know about it. And then those poor women, if in the likely event it is true, they have to watch this man. Like I said, fame, fortune, popularity, legend status, potentially it's, it, it's just sad and disgusting. And I, you know, maybe we find out Watson is 100% innocent. Some story comes out 10, 15, 20 years down the line where the Texans did pay these women to all lie about them. Then I'm going to look like a jackass, but as of right now, as it stands, I genuinely have a hard time believing it's the truth. Well said. <laughs> yeah, I, I quickly put. Yeah, I, I had to, I had to lean into my, my anger a little bit there because it's, it's disgusting. And then you know, there's a big narrative right now where people are talking about uh, Calvin Ridley, who's been suspended the entire next year because he bet fifteen hundred dollars on a football game. And like, I agree with that. I agree that he should be in trouble and probably a lot of trouble. Because you can't be doing that. That's how the NFL slowly becomes rigged and it ruins the, the legitimacy of the sport. But he gets a year. You beat your wife, you get three, you get three games. You get six games. You, you uh, get a DUI. You hit a tree with your car. You get a game. There are way worse crimes that are committed. And players do not get penalized for them nearly as harshly. And I just think that's ridiculous. And I don't think that means you should reduce Ridley's sentence. I don't think two wrongs make a right there. But, like, there should be some, people who do horrendous things, like Joe Mixon, even though that was kind of self-defense. Um, I'm trying to think of Ray Rice. You know, Ray Rice, his initial uh, punishment was a two-game suspension. And then the Ravens, the video came out, and they cut him, and then he got blackballed. That wasn't the league. That was the owners. That was the GMs being like, okay, the league's not going to do this, so we're going to take it into our own hands and deal with it. And I understand it's a business, you know, Clint talked about it um, during his interview. The NFL is a business, but names like that are bad for business. Now, there are a lot of people who have boycotted the NFL. You know, some of them are stupid over the whole Kaepernick thing, but a lot of people have boycotted it because there are uh, murderers and rapists and abusers in the league currently making millions and millions of dollars in our household names and are praised daily and treated like gods. And it's, it's just disgusting. It really is. That's, that's the dark side of the NFL, truly. Like, you know, at the end of the day, big man do ball. That's fun. But you take a step back, big man do ball, but also beat woman. I, I, that might've been a little bit of a little bit offensive. I'm sorry for that. Um, I, I was just trying to build off of build off of big man do ball, but yeah, you get the point. You know, you get the point. It's absolutely ridiculous. And I, I could go in a whole rant about how bad the NFL treats people. You know, we saw the whole Michael Sam thing. What, what was it a decade ago where he was an openly gay NFL player? And, you know, granted, he wasn't the best, but the way people talked about him, like John Gruden, you know, saying, I can't believe they're letting F words in the league now and all that kind of stuff. And, the way the, the Snyders are apparently treating their cheerleaders where they're literally prostituting them and all that. It's, it's truly repulsive. That's the kind of stuff that makes me question why I love this league so much and why I love this sport so much. But then, you know, you turn on highlights and you see somebody just do something absolutely stupid that no human should be able to do. And you're like, that's why they produce a great product, but like any other major capitalist organization or business, it's really fucking shady. Yeah. I didn't mean to go on a rant like that. That was I, I didn't I didn't mean to go into all that, but the main point is 
Watson, not good. Me no likey. Yeah, if I was the GM, I would be staying away from that yeah, as a whole. But they're not. And Watson's going to get traded for like three first-round picks, a good player, a couple second-round picks, and he's going to go on to be great for some team, and that's going to be the end of it. That's going to be how that works. Um, but let's, let's talk about a more wholesome human, a nicer person, Carson Wentz. Love me some Carson Wentz off the field. Dude's a sweetheart. Genuinely, you know, we've seen the stories of him, that little boy that was the big Wentz fan that's buried in his jersey and he wears his, Wentz wears his bracelet every day through every game. And you watch him on Hard Knocks, he's a girl dad. Everybody loves a girl dad. Uh, you know, he got traded too. Two third round picks to the Washington football team. Uh, Andrew, do you have any thoughts on that trade? I kind of, I think that he is statistically underrated. Because mm-hmm. he's like, isn't it? He had twenty-seven touchdowns, seven interceptions. That's like something good like that. Numbers. Yeah, yeah. Those are good numbers, and that was like without. Well, you have like whoever. I don't even who who's the number one receiver on the Colts. Oh, um, like Michael Pittman. Yeah, Michael Pittman. It, it, it's not a good receiver core. That's the main thing. Exactly. Going here. It's not a good receiver. So you core. have you have him going from that. With the, that receiver core, with those stats, to having Terry McLaurin, yeah, big difference. I I think I think it's a great change of scenery for him. I think that he's going to he's gonna he's gonna play pretty well. But there's always the issues with like his game, like maybe his decision making's off in certain moments. But like I think that he's consistent enough. To he's better than Taylor Heineken. We know that. That's <laughs> yeah. all that they really need. Yeah. Um. See, I look at the Wentz trade more as a bridge quarterback situation. I mean, you're right. Statistically, Wentz is pretty good, but I, I like to look beyond the numbers, right? Because if you look at the numbers, Kirk Cousins is a top five quarterback, and he's not. He's he's just not. You know, I I am the average Kirk Cousins hater. I am the average that boy nice enjoyer. Um. <laughs> And, and I think if you look at the tape with Carson Wentz, depending on the week, you either see MVP Wentz from Philly or you see a bottom five quarterback. Having Carson Wentz at your quarterback is, or as your quarterback is like playing a game of Russian roulette where five times out of six, you know, he's, he's going to have an average game, maybe bad, but then every once in a while he's going to come out and shit the bet. He's just going to be the worst quarterback you could possibly have. And we saw that last year primarily against Jacksonville in the last week of the season. They have one team to beat to go to the playoffs. One team. And they lost to the Jaguars. Wentz just isn't the guy that's going to win you big games. He's solid. He's serviceable. He's better than Taylor Heineke. But that's not enough. However, you're giving up two third-round picks for him. One of them is a conditional third that could become a second if he plays 70% of snaps. But those two third-round picks... You trade them for a quarterback that, again, is just going to be serviceable for next year. And you go out with the 11th pick. You draft a guy like Malik Willis. You draft a Matt Corral. You draft a Kenny Pickett. You sit them for the majority of next year or even the entire year. That's good development for them. And then in 2023, you get an out on Carson Wentz's massive contract. You cut him. And you have your young quarterback that you let sit for a year because that's kind of the trend now where you draft these quarterbacks that have really good intangibles. You sit them for a year. So they can develop behind the scenes and they come out and explode, right? Mahomes did it. Um, Justin Field should have did it or should have done it. Excuse me. Um, I, I don't hate the trade for the, for the, for the commanders. I always call them the football team again. They need to stop switching names. I, I'm sick of yeah. it. I'm sick of it. You know what? That's they should have stayed. They should have stayed as the football team. Commanders. Commanders. They no, commanded. Yeah. We? Yeah. Listen, listen. Okay. They ain't commanded shit. Yeah. <laughs> I hate that name so much. Listen, when they did the, the name selection process, there was one name that stood out to me that I really liked. They could have been the Washington Demon Cats. That would have that been would be, sick. Yeah. That is sick. <laughs> like, it's goofy. Don't get me wrong. It's a little bit goofy. Maybe not professional enough. But can you imagine? Someone says, hey, what team do you like? Oh, I like the Demon Cats. I- I'm your average Demon Cats enjoyer. I'm a big Demon Cats fan. That's just cool. And I will admit, Commanders is better than, like, the Washington Football Club or uh, the wa- just the Washington or the Washington Presidents or whatever. But the, the Commanders, 
You know, they they did a they did an interview with Chase Young, the face of that team right now, a couple of weeks before they selected the name, and it was like having him grade the potential names because they had a list out, and he gave them an F. Even Chase Young doesn't like the name. <laughs> and he is the face of your team right now. They should have stuck with the football team, and I will stand by that because that's also goofy. But it's the good yeah. type of goofy. That's a marketable name. People enjoyed it. People really enjoyed it. Maybe it makes your team less serious, you know. But imagine the football team wins the Super Bowl. Oh, who won the Super Bowl? Oh, it was the football team. It was the football team. Just Duh. the football team. That's beautiful. But now it's, oh, who won? Oh, it was the Commanders. It was the Commanders. That's what you get when the guy running your team right now is probably going to get thrown in prison because he's a piece of shit and a horrible person. Um, so, yeah, the Commanders is bad. And I hate them for that. I was starting to become a, a part-time Washington football team enjoyer. Just because it was, again, so goofy. And then the uniforms. Listen, listen. Why is there gradient? Why do they have gradient jerseys? They're so ugly. They they did all black uniforms and they messed it up. How do you mess up all black uniforms? Yeah. And the, the white uniforms are so disgusting. They're so disgusting. Like, this is how you do a white uniform. It's classic. You got the white. Yeah. You got the you got the stripes. You got the you got the number. That's all you need. You don't need gradient. This isn't the NBA. This isn't your city jersey or whatever the hell they call it now. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. It, it makes no sense. <laughs> and I understand. I'm like a month late to this, but I don't care. I hate it. If you're a Washington Commanders fan, you're bad, and you should feel bad. I'm sorry. But I, I guess I, I guess it's better than Redskins, you know. They they, they really yeah. didn't like that name, so I'll give them I'll give them slight slight credit for that. I'm giving that move an F plus. The plus is just because they're politically correct now, but yeah. otherwise it's terrible. <laughs> and then and then the logo they did a seal logo. Why this isn't hockey? You aren't the fucking Winnipeg Commanders. You're the Washington Commanders. You are a team based in the capital of the United States. Act like it. <laughs> but yes, uh, Carson Wentz, I don't hate the move. I think it's fine for them if they're planning to use him as a bridge quarterback and then, you know, cut him at the end of the year and move on. However, for the Colts, their quarterback right now is Jacob Eason. And that's not good. That's not good. Yeah, change it. Change it. Fix it. Don't get Kirk Cousins. I need him to stay in Minnesota so he can continue to be painfully mediocre. Don't get Kirk Cousins. Go get yourself Derek Carr. Derek Carr makes you a contender. Yeah. Derek Carr is a good quarterback. Um, or they, they're in a position – no, they don't have their first round pick. I was going to say they can draft a quarterback. No, they can't. Um, go out, free agency, get yourself Derek Carr, trade for him, and then sign Allen Robinson. I hate Allen Robinson, but you give him a good wide receiver – or a good quarterback, he's going to be a good wide receiver. Yeah. And then you got JT in the backfield. Almost was MVP this year. Um, I don't know how the defense is going to be without Eberflus, but you still got Darius Leonard there, who that poor guy, this will be his fifth quarterback in his five years in Indianapolis. That sucks oh for him. Word. Yeah, uh, which, I mean, you know, his quarterback, I guess you can say lately because he's on defense, but imagine being a consistent all-pro linebacker and on the other side of the field you got – Carson Wentz and Jacob Eason and whoever the hell else. <laughs> Who was even the starter before Wentz? Uh, I, don't, I don't even know. I have no idea. I, I can't remember either because the Colts used to be irrelevant. Um, I know it's Rich saying that as a Bears fan, but, you know, that sucks for them. What other trade happened? Oh, Amari Cooper got traded for a bag of chips. They traded that him for a fifth round pick. Yeah, well, Okay. That trade is like the Mac trade again, where Amari wow. Cooper is making $20 million a year, and the Browns are taking on all of that. And the Cowboys are a team that needed cap help, and they have good wide receivers behind them. You know, C.D. Lamb might be better than Amari Cooper is now. Michael Gallup's good, assuming he comes back from his ACL tear and even three signs with the team. Um, Cedric Wilson's pretty good. They have a good wide receiver core, even without Amari Cooper. So getting rid of him, you save yourself $20 million over the next couple of years. That's big, especially when you're paying Zeke to be an overpriced fullback. And um, Dak, 
to be, you know, French top 10 quarterback. He deserves his pay. Um, and then you look at it for the Browns. You're just giving Baker Mayfield another wide receiver to waste, unfortunately. Exactly. Potentially. Even though I kind of like Baker Mayfield, I don't know if he's going to recover from this injury too well, which is rather unfortunate for him. But you trade away a fifth round pick for Amari Cooper. That's a steal. You know, you pull the trigger on that if you're given the opportunity. But I, I remember looking on Twitter and it got leaked that the Cowboys were asking for a third, but would accept a fourth. And Cowboys Twitter was blowing up. What the hell are you doing? He's worth way more than that. And then you get a fifth round pick out of him. <laughs> like, I understand the move, but I still feel like he could have gotten a little bit more. Although I guess yeah. $20 million is a steep price for a wide receiver who wasn't necessarily impressive last year, and I don't know. But it's a steal for the it's a steal for the Browns. You know, you're getting that guy. Um, and then you draft a wide receiver uh, towards the top of the towards the top of the draft, potentially get yourself a wide receiver too. Maybe they're the team that trades for Derek Carr. I could see that. Derek Carr and Amari Cooper back together in Cleveland. Not against that. Not against that. Um, and then they're trying to get rid of Jarvis Landry. Uh, he's getting cut. I hope he goes back to Miami just because I feel like he needs to go home. He's still a serviceable wide receiver. He's still a good route runner. He's not quite the athlete he used to be, but there's still something there. Um, I think that's everyone, right? We talked about Wentz. We talked about um, Wilson, Mack, and Cooper, and Watson. Um, Caruso's back. The Caruso has returned to Chicago. Rejoice. Yeah. After the the tragedy of Grace and Allen being a dirty son of a bitch, um, I think the Bulls game is actually about to start as we're recording this. But uh, Levine's hurt, so he's not playing, which sucks. But Caruso is back, back in action, back in black, if you will. I don't think the Bulls are wearing black tonight. That would be sick if they did. Yeah, that would have been a dope line. <laughs> Wear the black unis tonight. That would be kind of sick. Um, that would be sick. I don't know. Is there anything else you want to add here, Andrew? Uh, the Celtics are, have been showing out recently. Yeah, nobody Absolutely cares. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Talk about the Celtics. Please talk more. Uh, talk about the Celtics. Yeah, since the year has started, let me count here on the schedule. One. We're, so we're one and two right now. Two and two. Three and two. Four and two. Four and three. Let me just say this right now. I'm not going to count all that. That's annoying. But like... We are like twenty two and like seven in the last twenty nine games, and we are currently on a five game winning streak. Mm-hmm. I before the season, I said, and this will be a terrible prediction in the future. I said that we would be a play in team. I'm wrong. I'm completely wrong, and I'm very happy about it. Where are the Celtics at right now in the standings? I think they're fifth. Chicago's they're, fourth, right? Let me check here. Last I saw, Chicago was fourth. Eastern Conference standings. Yeah, Bulls are fourth. Celtics are fifth. So we're still better is what you're saying. Oh, well, we're literally tied. I yeah, think. but we're still we're better. Both. Our number yeah. is higher. Therefore, to casual NBA fan, we are better. You are better. <laughs> the, the le- it's so close in the East right now. It's insane. Mm-hmm. We're four games back, and we're the fifth seed. Yeah, like there's uh, there's legitimate contenders in the Eastern Conference that are going to get knocked out in the first round of the playoffs. Yeah. That's so crazy. But the Cavs are the sixth seed, and they're mm-hmm. six games behind. Holy shit, Nuts. really? Six? Yeah. So who's the one seed, and how many games ahead are they right now? Heat, and they're up by two and a half. There goes Heat, Bucks, 76ers, Bulls, Celtics, Cavs, Raptors, Nets. <laughs> the Nets. <laughs> uh, that's disappointing for them. That did you crazy. see? Did you see Harden's return when he played Brooklyn? Shot like uh, did he play bad? He shot like three of seventeen, had four turnovers. Yeah. <laughs> and that's I don't. Hilarious. I don't think Ben Simmons played, did he? No, he didn't. He was just in the stands, I think. Yeah, because yeah. I, I I saw I saw a video of them chanting like "F Ben Simmons" or something. And Blake Griffin was sitting there, and he looks over at the guy recording. He's like, it's kind of catchy. Not going to lie, it's kind of catchy. <laughs> <laughs> that was good stuff. Uh, yeah. Oh, 
Coach Pop, winningest coach of all time now. Oh, yeah, true. That's awesome. Greatest coach in NBA history, easily. I 100%. From a Bulls fan. From a Bulls fan. From a Phil Jackson supporter. Pop's the best all time. Yeah. Um, Also, I just want to point out, I love how LeBron's dropped 50 twice, like in the past week. But both nights, something bigger has happened. Coach, last night he dropped 50. Coach Pop won more games. Won the most games. The last when he dropped fifty-seven against the Warriors, UNC went in and beat Duke in Coach K's last game. Yeah. So, to me, the most die-hard basketball fan ever that knows more than all of you combined, those two things matter more than LeBron. So ignore him. Don't talk about him. Jordan's better. Forever, forever, forever. Never talk about LeBron again. Just erase him from your memory. If we don't talk about him, if we don't give him attention, eventually he'll go away. Eventually, he will go away. And I'm telling you right now, I know we're supposed to appreciate greatness, you know, when it's happening. And I get that in every instance except for LeBron, because the day he retires, I will rejoice. When Kobe retired, I was never a big Kobe fan. When Kobe retired, I was sad. When Tim Duncan I was retired, I was sad. Dirk, I was sad. Dwayne Wade, Paul Pierce, you know, all, all the other greats. When LeBron retires, bro, I'm, I'm going to go ballistic. I'm going to be so happy. <laughs> And, and, you know, everyone responded, oh, he's, he's still the GOAT. He's still better. No, he's not. LeBron isn't Jordan. He will never be Jordan. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you why. I'm not going to give you a reason why right now because I'm not getting into that because I will be here for the next three hours yelling at the screen. Yep. But LeBron's better than Jordan. I'm going on a lot of tangents today for no reason. I think my mind is just active currently and wants to speak. <laughs> Like, you know, th- these podcasts are too one-sided, first of all. I talk way too much. But, like, having Clint on and for 30 minutes not getting to talk a lot, I think my brain was like, okay, now talk more. Make up for it. <laughs> Make up for it. There's 30 minutes of this where you're not talking. Fix it. Which is bad. I need to work on that. <laughs> I, I dare not speak when you get your ball rolling. That's my, You need to. You my, need to cut that's... me off. I talk too much. I'm not going to cut you off when you're in the middle of your tangents. You need to, though, day. because you don't talk <laughs> enough. You need to talk more. I, get, I have so many people fucking message me and text me. I need to stop cursing. I have so many people text me and message me, and they're like, Andrew doesn't talk enough. Andrew isn't loud enough. And it's, like, not your fault. I just talk too much. And I'm doing <laughs> it right now. I'm doing it right now. <sighs> <Ooh>. <laughs> Oh, goodness. But I suppose that that's the beauty of this, right? The the beauty of the name and whatnot, the namesake. Yeah. Because I, I go on my little tangents and you're just like, okay. <laughs> Alrighty. Well. Alrighty. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we do need to work on that. <laughs> we will. It'll get better. It's episode yeah. less than 10. I yeah, think. episode less than 10. And we had a future Chicago Bear on already. How about that? How about them apples, you know? How about that? First guest we ever had on the pot on the podcast. Future Chicago future Bear New Legend. York Giant. Yeah, future New York Giant. <laughs> Ew, I got way too close. That did not work the way I wanted it to. <laughs> I wanted that to be intimidating because I but I wasn't looking at the camera, so it got like weird. Uh, apologies. Uh, <laughs> now future New York Giant is Mitchell Trubisky. That's future New York Giant. Yeah. Future future starting quarterback as well. Those rumors are heating up, by the way. I, Getting yeah, a lot of so. traction. It's going to happen. I'm not opposed to it. I've said it before. I'm not opposed. Yeah. Today's Saturday. NFL free agency officially opens tomorrow. Yeah. Rejoice. The NFL is about to explode. And I hate to break it to you. Yeah, I hate to break it to you, but the Bears are signing everyone to one dollar contracts, just everyone. Actually, yeah, I I heard a rumor. Um, yeah, they're signing everyone for one dollar a piece. That's so crazy. Yeah, yeah, they're getting they're trading for all the draft picks too, for like cash considerations, which I don't think is a thing in the NFL. But the Bears are just that good. They're just going to be that good next year. It's just how football works, you know. Does that mean that Aaron Rodgers is going to be a starting quarterback? No, he's he's gonna sit behind Fields. Oh, He'll be like eighth on the depth chart. We 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 only accept winners in Chicago. We don't want choke artists. Of course, of course. we don't want choke artists. That the Chicago uh, Bears only accept winners. Yeah, That's we've nice. never lost a football game ever. Never have actually. Never. Yeah, 
<laughs> the cameras just weren't on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> See, the the left wing NFL media wants you to believe that the Chicago Bears lose a lot of football games. It's just not true. This is not true. Yeah. See, I'm your head out of the dirt. Guys, yep. Seriously. I am based in Chicago pilled right now. And I'm, th- <laughs> Dude, I'm literally just talking at this point. <laughs> I'm just saying words. <laughs> this is the coolest <laughs> back and forth we've ever had. <laughs> yeah. Like this is a great episode. We had a real guest and now I'm just saying words. <laughs> yeah. I'm just I'm trying to fill time. From that is going down. Yeah. I'm just trying to fill time because I don't, I don't know how much time we've taken up. Um, Either way, it's a great episode. Yeah, we we had a little bit of everything. A little bit of everything. Uh, join us next Ooh. week when Justin Fields comes on. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Ooh. <laughs> One day. Ooh. One day. That's what we're going to do. this week. Yeah, listen. <laughs> Cl- listen, Clint Ratkovich responding to my DM. I'm just going to start DMing every player I like. and get, Eventually, one of them's going to respond. It might be the Bears' like third-string long snapper. But that's a Bears player. It's a dub. It's a dub. It's a dub. I'm going to go DM Dick Butkus right now. In fact, I'll do it live. I'll do it live. Do it live. He's just like, responds. Yep. Joins this clip for right now. <laughs> Where is he? Where is he? Can I not DM? I hope he doesn't have like his DMs off. That would suck. I feel like he would, cause, just because his mm-hmm. name is Dick Butkus. I think he so does. I think he Aww. does. Oh, frown, frowny face. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. We'll uh, <laughs> we'll DM um. No, where where's Lance Briggs? We'll DM. No, I can't DM him either. Jesus, man. Here, no. I, I figure most of the people. Who have, uh, are, who are verified are gonna have their DMs off. Now that I think about it, I think Clint. I can only DM him because his D, his uh, he's not verified, which is stupid. Twitter verify Clint Rakovich. If you're seeing Seriously. this, verify him. Super future superstar. Future. Now that he's been on the podcast, yep. you know it's him. So yeah, you you know it's him. You absolutely know it's him. We can confirm. We mm-hmm. can confirm he's yep. a real person. Yep. What's that? Wasn't Clint Rakovich? No, I'm just playing. Less. This is a bot. You put a bot on the podcast. We got some like Marvel scroll stuff going on here. Just stole his <laughs> identity. No, I'm just playing. Yeah. Um, speaking of Clay Rakovich, real quick, I just want to put it out there. Me and Andrew before the podcast, whenever questions we wanted to ask, and um, there was one I wanted to ask Clint, but I decided not to. And it was because uh, you know I've compared Jordan Davis to the Hulk. I've compared Kyle Hamilton to Spider Man. So I was going to say, which Avenger is Clay Rakovich? <laughs> But that's like that's that's cheesy. You know, it's too cheesy to an NFL hopeful. Yeah, it's gonna be like what the fuck's a comic book? (laughs) I I only know working hard and being a tremendous football player. I only know being better than everyone else in the room. I I don't. (laughs) I love how we're saying that. He was like the most humble guy. Like just such a great dude. Yeah, did not say that on himself at all. Mm -hmm. I do really like though. Uh, I know we keep talking about him, but like you know, that's that's kind of kind of what this one's about. Um, I do really like how he emphasized that like he he's a very good locker room guy and a team player and all that kind of stuff. That's what you want to hear a football player say. Exactly. You know, it's all fun and games that they can come out and be like, you know, I'm really explosive. I can make the big plays. Cool. But what are you doing for the team? What are you doing for the other guys? The other 52 guys on the team? What are you doing? And um. Oh, voice crack. That was bad. That's a sign that we need to wrap up. My voice is telling me to shut up. Um, but yeah, if, if Clint Rakovich is wearing a Bears jersey, or, d- 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 I can't talk. <laughs> no, take your time. Take if, your time. If, listen, this is just my body telling me to shut up. I've gone too much. <laughs> I've talked too much. Um, if Clint Rakovich is wearing a Bears jersey next year, I will own three. I will buy three Clint Ratkins I will, jerseys. I will buy one, and I'm going to be like the type of person that's like, I talked to that guy once. I'm going to follow him throughout his entire Yeah, I mean, career. I'm getting a Ratkovich jersey no matter what, as long as he doesn't go to that team up north in Green Bay or the Vikings or the Steelers. Then I will have to sadly disown him. But Unfortunately. if he's not on one of those three teams, I'm going to get his jersey. You know, Hopefully, if he doesn't go to the Bears, he goes to a team with a cool jersey. The Dolphins. 
Clint Rakovich would actually fit very well in the Dolphins. I was going to say, that's a great fit. Yeah, it actually is. You know, they're going to be running that same type of Shanahan-style offense, um, especially considering their offensive coordinators coming over from uh, from the 49ers and worked under Shanahan. But, yeah, before I start, you know, stuttering and falling over my words and whatnot again, this has been an interesting episode. It's been fun. Um, it's always good to have one that's not quite as serious, even though it was very serious there for a stretch of time. Like, we, we were talking about uh, sexual assault victims, and now we're ending off with just absolute being silly, goofy dudes. But Silly gooses, for sure. Yeah, that's that's the beauty of our personalities, I fear. Anyways, um, Andrew, unless you have anything else to add, that's going to be all from us today. Make sure you uh, subscribe. I'm going to keep reminding you guys to do that because 60% of our viewers still aren't subscribed, which is unbelievable. absolutely redonkulous preposterous it's it's just bad big dumb stupid fix it fix it fix it or andrew will cry yeah we will we will open next podcast with andrew crying if we don't get at least one new subscriber between now and then that's all i'm asking just one of you can prevent this sweet boy from crying and if you do if you do subscribe if we get one subscriber andrew will dance to open the next podcast Yep, that he, is the the choice that he, you have. Yep, that's the choice that you have. He'll do a fun little fun little man dance, boy dance. Mm-hmm. He's still a boy, he's a minor. Um, and for 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 every hold on for every new subscriber we get between now and the next episode, Andrew will dance for one more minute. So one subscriber, that's a one minute dance. Two minutes, that's a two minute dance. Three, <laughs> four, five. Imagine we get like a thousand I would, subs. <laughs> I, would, I would die. I would die. Clint Radkovich like retweets it on Twitter, blows us up. Wait, we become a whole, a whole like overnight sensations. Andrew has to dance for the entirety of the hour podcast. I have to dance for like literal years. It's okay. He's a theater kid. He likes dancing. He's used to it. I won't do it for more than like five seconds. <laughs> <on the podcast. laughs> But anyways, that's it from us. Um, We hope you enjoyed. (laughs) Again, make sure to subscribe, like the video, comment down below. Um, I told myself I'm going to start asking a question at the end of these, and I forgot to ask you your question. I mean, understandable. Too bad you're getting one anyways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, What is your favorite color? Blue. This guy gets it. This guy gets it. Um, so for those of you who are going to comment, what is, um, who got you into football or basketball or whatever sport you like? Who was your first favorite athlete? Mine was Brian Urlacher. Who was yours, Andrew? Rajon Rondo. Former Bulls legend. Didn't play for any other teams, just the Bulls. The Mavericks red. <laughs> the Mavericks No, nope, only played for the Bulls. Didn't play for anyone else. Anyways. That's the end of this. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to stop ranting and being silly, goofy guys. I never know how to end these, so I'm just going to end it. Goodbye.